to thank a couple of people. First of all, my wonderful husband, Frank, who's here with me and traveled and has moved multiple times and supported me through a lot of different career transitions and who I'm so thankful for. And then just to acknowledge a couple of mentors, um, not all of whom are here today, but um, at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Eric Donnie, as well as Dr. Alan Sved were my primary mentors, and Eric and Alan, and especially Eric, were really responsible for my interest in product regulation, but also for really my training and development as a scientist, and there's no way that I would be here without them and without Eric, so I'm so grateful to them. Um, and my mentor at the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. Matt Carpenter, who is here, um, is my second postdoctoral mentor and now my faculty mentor. And he has been responsible for my training um, in broadening my horizons beyond nicotine reduction, as well as in thinking about moving from a professional standpoint into an independent career and into a faculty position. And, um, and so I really appreciate his guidance through that. And um, thank you so much to all of you. So our final award this afternoon is the Dahl Winder Award for Research in Epidemiology and Public Health. This is named for two giants in the field, Dr. Uh, Sir Richard Dahl and Ernst Winder. Our recipient is Dr. Anne McNeil, Professor of Tobacco Addiction at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And I am going to introduce her introducer, uh, who uh, is Yes, I know it's Jonathan Foulds, but I don't know what page I'm on. Well, all right, do I just have to introduce Jonathan? <laughs> Jonathan Foulds, if you could come up, I have no other words because I've lost my place in my notes. So if you could introduce <laughs> Dr. McNeil, I would appreciate it. And I'm going to use some slides, yes. So welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see that you're, you're all suitably distanced in the audience. Good job. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anne McNeil to present her Dollwinder presentation. Um, I want to say a little bit about the award and about the people that it was named after first. Uh, so this award, uh, in, after Richard Dahl and Ernst Winder, honors scientists who have made groundbreaking advances in public health. Uh, and I just want, I realize I'm now one of the oldies in SRNT, so I thought we should, we should uh, remind some of the younger people who these, who these folks are. So Sir Richard Dahl, it's now 70 years ago, it's amazing really, 70 years ago that these giants of tobacco research, Sir Richard Dahl and Ernst Winder, really discovered that smoking causes lung cancer and published the papers in that year. Uh, 1950 that, that really proved that fact. Uh, so Richard Dahl was described as one of the most distinguished medic medical epidemiologists that the world has ever known. And in, in um, September of that year, they published a, a paper in the British Medical Journal um, that's described here. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, slightly, just beaten to the post by Ernst Winder, and his colleagues, and they published a, a, quite a similar paper in JAMA uh, in May of that year. Uh, it seems like the editors for the BMJ, uh, the reviewers, wanted a little bit more work done in that paper, and that meant that, that Winder and Evers beat them to the post. But these are, these are really the, the giants in our field on whom a lot of the subsequent work over the last 70 years has been built. And it's, it's appropriate that this very prestigious award uh, has been named after those people. So let's talk a little bit about Anne McNeil. Uh, she made her mark in her field in the 1980s. She actually had decided to, after her, her uh, uh, undergraduate degree, to take a little bit of a break from academia. Uh, she went to Africa and she was a teacher. And when she came back uh, by somewhat happenstance, I think. There was a, a PhD position with uh, uh, Mike Russell, Martin Jarvis, Robert West, to look at the uptake of, of smoking in, in teenagers. Uh, and of course, this, is, this topic of the uptake of nicotine addiction in teenagers, here we are 
uh, you know, 30 years later or more, and it's still something that we're, we're trying to grapple with. Uh, so she did one of the most influential early studies, in fact, two or three of them, as part of her PhD. Um, this slide, just, I'm just going to quickly show you a, a little bit of results from that. And it, it's got the date, so we can tell how long ago that was. So this was a, a cohort of um, uh, girls in high school in, in London. And she, amongst the studies, recruited a group uh, who continued to smoke uh, from about age 11 to 14 on to 15, 16. Um, and, and it basically showed that they had already high cotinine levels, so relatively high nicotine uptake right from the start of their smoking career. And within a year and two years, cigarette consumption increased, cotinine increased, um, and, and it was also shown in the associated publications that they smoke for the reinforcing effects of nicotine. The cotinine levels were correlated uh, with uh, withdrawal symptoms and craving and all the things that we now recognize as the characteristics of nicotine dependence. And this is the, one of the conclusions to that paper in 1989. Our findings suggest that young smokers learn to inhale cigarette smoke very early in their smoking careers, and that the pharmacological effects of nicotine are already important in reinforcing their smoking. Um, since then, Professor McNeill's contributed to groundbreaking advances in public policy in, in many ways. I'm going to mention just, just a few because I, I could take too long. Um, she co-authored the first uh, peer-reviewed smoking cessation guidelines uh, and also the cost effectiveness evidence in England, which supported uh, the new smoking cessation services that were developed in the UK uh, at the end of the 1990s, the beginning of, of 2000s, just about the time that I thought there was no longer a career in smoking research, and I dipped out for a little while. That's when things really got going. Oh well. Um, but uh, you know, the, her, her research and her advocacy uh, was influential in, in getting the National Smoking Cessation Services going in the UK. Um, in, in addition, I mean, I, I could list loads and loads of things. She's worked very closely with Public Health England um, to, to do evidence reviews on e-cigarettes. Uh, she's done lots of research on smoking and people with mental health problems in the UK so that that's been tackled uh, in the way that it should be. Um, uh, she's done uh, research on point of sale and, and made sure so that when you go to England and you go into a, a, a store that sells tobacco, you, no long, you don't have the firewall there with, with all the products. It's all behind a barrier. Um, so influence policy and tobacco control through research in, in a number of ways. But you, know, you could summarize it this way. Over 300 peer-reviewed publications and since 2015, has been uh, uh, regarded as being the top one percent of of researchers in our field. Um, I do want to say one little other thing. So, when I contacted Dr. McNeil um, to to say that I'd like to nominate her, she's a very modest person, and she informed me that um, she initially thought that her contributions didn't merit such a prestigious award. But I knew she was also a little bit of a feminist. So I told her that all the seven prior awardees were white male who work in the United States. And so at that point she said, oh, well then, go <laughs> ahead. Um, so in summary, Dr. McNeil has made groundbreaking advances in tobacco research and policy, public health policy, throughout her career, uh, both in the UK and internationally with the ITC project. Um, and I would like to invite her to come and give her talk. Uh, so let's give a rounding, rousing round of applause for Anne McNeil, this year's Dolphin Dollar. Thank you. Thank you very
Okay, thank you uh, very much indeed. Um, thank you to Jonathan for nominating me. Thank you to the SRT Awards Committee uh, for awarding me. There are very many other people in the field who are more deserving of this award than I am. Um, and thank you all in particular for coming during these particularly difficult um, circumstances. So, um, I set myself a very challenging title for this talk, but I'm actually going to talk a little bit about my career at the same time. Uh, and, and during that, um, I'm going to uh, thank a number of people. I think where I am today is a lot due to luck um, and also the people I work with. So I'll be uh, mentioning quite a few people. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. I don't work for any uh, commercial companies. My funding's from government and uh, non-governmental sectors. Um, Briefly, what I'm going to talk about then in summary is some of the early influences on my career um, and how I moved from prevention to cessation to harm reduction. I spend a lot of my time on harm reduction at the moment. Uh, and through it, I'm going to weave and try and answer this challenging question I set myself, but then really finish by what role we can play in the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. Um, when I did my PhD viva in uh, 1990, I think it was, um, the examiner at the end uh, said to me uh, that I'd passed, thankfully, uh, but he said, you didn't start very well. Um, fortunately, you improved, so I thought, oh, you know, good, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. Um, but when I thought back, I thought, well, what was the first question? And the first question was, what influenced you to, uh, to join tobacco? Um, why were you interested in smoking? Uh, and I talked about my dad. Um, who was a big influence uh, on me um, in many, many ways, but he was also a very, very heavy smoker. Um, in fact, in the 18 years I lived with him, um, I can't remember one day when he didn't smoke a cigarette. Um, so it stayed with me. Why was it not important to talk about my kind of lived experience, if you like, of, of smoking? Um, because I felt, felt I'd learned more from that than reading um, a number of books and journal articles in the uh, libraries of the Institute of Psychiatry. Uh, we were from Liverpool. Actually, uh, for those of you who are from England, we're woolly backs. We're on the other side of the Mersey. Um, but that is a picture of the Mersey Ferry. And my dad used to get the Mersey Ferry in the morning to go to uh, work. And uh, he would tell us stories in the evening, tell me and my sister little anecdotes about the day. And so many of these had a thread of smoking in them. Um, and this, just this one story that stuck with me was that um, he, he often was very worried how he was going to get his pack of 20 cigarettes on the way home from work. Um, and he um, said to the ticket uh, man at the ferry, um, he asked for 20 cadets, which were the cigarettes he smoked, rather than the uh, ticket. Um, so he was a, a big influence uh, on me, as it's Liverpool, actually, and I'll probably make a few more mentions of Liverpool as I go through. But therefore, I was very pleased when we set up our UK Centre for Tobacco Control Studies around 2006. Now, for those of you who are not in uh, England, um, we have a consortium of academics across different universities, and we work together. And I think this has been a very powerful example of working across different disciplines and different universities. You'll recognize some of the people in this photograph, a very dapper young Paul Aviard there on the left-hand side, who's going to give a plenary tomorrow. Um, but one of the things we did, which I thought was very important, is we set up a smokers panel. And although um, myself and a number of people contributed to this, I want to um, name Professor Linda Bald, who actually led this initiative. And what we did is we asked smokers to come and talk to us um, about our research. Were we asking the right questions in our surveys? Um, what, were we interpreting the data that we found correctly? Um, and and it, this has been hugely important, and we continue it to this day. Uh, it moved from Bath to Nottingham, and that's a picture of Anna Gilmore, I think, presenting to the uh, smokers panel. I think this is quite unusual. I'm not sure whether you um, have this user involvement in other countries, but I think it's incredibly powerful. So it, part of my answer to the question about what influences alternative nicotine, tobacco, harm-reducing products on public health is, I think we have to put the smokers or the tobacco users centre stage in trying to answer this question. So, as uh, Jonathan said, I joined Mike Russell's uh, team. That's Mike in the middle. Um, and I am on record of um, 
I was recorded a, a, an interview about women in science, which is something I um, spent a lot of time uh, working on. And I talked about the fact that I joined an all-male group. Um, but I have to say, it was a, it was a wonderful environment. We, we were allowed to develop our own ideas. We were allowed to disagree. Um, we were allowed to have foolish thoughts, and I have many, and some of them you'll see uh, during this talk. Um, at no time were we sort of bullied or harassed into having uh, a particular ideology or anything. The only time I was afraid was when my research was being discussed, and uh, was it rigorous enough? Um, and it was wonderful when Gay joined um, a couple of years later, Gay Sutherland there on the left-hand side. But Mike Russell, for those of you who uh, are new to the field, had an enormous influence. And as you know, Jonathan worked with him and is now in America, Yusuf Saluji in South Africa. Um, so um, I'm, I've left some names off this because otherwise you wouldn't be able to read it. But uh, uh, I, I'd encourage you to read about Mike's work if you haven't, because he really was a luminary. He uh, was ahead of his time. Um, when I showed this slide to Martin Rohr, actually, to ask him to check the accuracy of, the accuracy of it, he said, um, yes, I think it's fine, but what's all this NRG and TARG? It sounds like Star Trek. Um, those are the names, the acronyms we use for our, our research groups. Uh, and just if you haven't read it, um, just a, an article that Debbie Robson, Dr. Debbie Robson at, at King's, who's uh, one of the leaders of the future in this field, um, we wrote about his research. Okay, so Jonathan's talked about this, so I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about it, um, but just to mention Robert, a uh, useful looking Robert West and uh, Martin Jarvis there. Um, we uh, went round schools and we asked kids to spit into bottles so we could measure their cotinine and then also um, breathe into carbon monoxide monitors. And I, I feel at one point there was a bit of a competition going on amongst the girls to see who could get the highest reading on the CO monitor. Um, but um, Jonathan's talked about this work, and it is important, and people say to me, well, why aren't you really caring about e-cigarettes in youth? Well, I do. I do care about e-cigarette use in youth, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, my focus and why it's shifted as I move on. Um, obviously, it's better for young people not to be using nicotine, but I think we do need to look at the context of young people's uh, lives and what else they're doing. Um, and uh, you know, there's high usage of marijuana and other things among youth uh, today. And I have to say um, a big call out to Dr. Herzig for her as a talk this morning, which was absolutely fantastic. And the ABCD study is obviously going to answer a lot of the questions in this field. So I'm not going to say too much more about that, other than to say, you know, if there was really brain damage as a result of um, young people using uh, nicotine e-cigarettes. Um, there would have been a lot of brain damaged people walking around um, because it, it would have happened when people were smoking uh, in, in, in youth uh, many years ag ago. And that is a subliminal picture of me smoking my Marlboro. So yes, despite having lived with um, a family of smokers, um, and the evidence shows this, unfortunately, children of parents who smoke are very likely to go on to smoke themselves. Um, so, yeah, I am feeling a bit brain damaged at the moment, but I don't think it's because of the smoking. I think it's because of sleep deprivation. Okay, so um, the next steps in my career, um, I actually secured a postdoc here in the US, um, but unfortunately I was unable to take it up because at that time my uh, mother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Um, she was a non-smoker. She smoked a little bit and stopped smoking when she was pregnant. Uh, but of course, she was a very heavy passive, passive smoker because uh, my father smoked. And of course, at that time, you could smoke in the home. That was very common, still is common in, in some parts uh, of the world today. Um, and one thing I want to say is people often say that smoking doesn't affect social um, people socially or affect families. It does. Um, it was a real bone of contention in, in our family, uh, my father's smoking. And unfortunately, of course, my father then had the guilt on top of that um, of feeling he'd contributed uh, to my mother's lung cancer. And he died nine months after my father, also of lung cancer, sorry, after my mother, uh, also of lung cancer, um, but this time from active smoking. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to come here, um, and so I stayed in England. And, and again, I was very, very lucky 
um, to work in a government agency and work with some uh, really uh, strong epidemiologists and health educators. Uh, and Donald Reed was one of those, um, and Tom Glynn, um, also who many people will know. And the first thing we did is, um, so what, what we were doing in the national agency was, um, if you've got a limited amount of money, how do you spend it in order to reduce a nation's smoking prevalence? And of course, the first thing we do is review the evidence. We reviewed it both on the adult side and we reviewed it on the youth side. Uh, and, on, and our conclusions were that we needed to focus on population-wide uh, interventions, biggest bang for your bucks, basically, uh, and to focus more on adults than youth. And that was for a couple of reasons. One, the reason I've just said, is adult smoking influences uh, youth smoking. Um, but also because the evidence for the effectiveness of interventions to prevent young people from starting smoking um, is actually quite thin. At best, it probably delays. So that's where I moved and shifted a little bit uh, towards a focus on uh, adults. What would you do to prevent smoking, especially among young people? I certainly would not concentrate on trying to prevent a teenager from starting, because that's the one thing that will make him start. Uh, what I would concentrate on is getting the uh, young smoker to stop uh, so that it ceases to be the sign of being an adult. Uh, so that the people that the young, young people look up to are not smoking. So I thought, given the last several winners of this award were American, I thought um, it might be quite nice for some of you to see Sir Richard Doll, who's the other part of the uh, award, and hear his words uh, there around youth smoking. But of course, uh, the World Bank produced this graph uh, a few years later, uh, curbing the epidemic. Um, and this shows quite clearly, so the blue line is the baseline, the number of deaths that will go up. The green line is if we halve um, if I can read this, if the proportion of young adults taking up smoking halves, at the time it was written was by 2020, which is of course this year, and that's very close to the baseline. The red line is if you halve adult consumption. So if you're trying to have an impact on uh, the mortality and morbidity caused by smoking, then you do have to focus quite a lot on adult smokers uh, to have that immediate effect. And I show this uh, graph pretty early on whenever I'm teaching students, because if you ask students, you know, what do you do about smoking? Oh, you need to stop young people from starting. Um, this puts it in a little bit more uh, sharper perspective, I think, about the need to focus on adults. So again, Jonathan's talked about this, so I won't say. Um, it was luck working with Martin Rohr and Robert West and working closely with civil servants. We were able to influence the white paper and get the National Smoking Ces Cessation Services set up. Sadly, um, it's now being uh, disinvested from as a strategy, but it was good while it lasted. But I also want to mention, um, and I know um, there may be a couple of you here, but we had a big international summit the government held in 1997, um, in which many SRT members participated, and that's when the government was consulting on the white paper. Um, and unfortunately, Tessa Jow and uh, Frank, Robs Frank Dobson, who were the Secretary of State for Health and the Under Secretary of State for Health at the time, have since passed away. Uh, but they were instrumental in getting smoking kills. But Ken Kalman taught me a, an important lesson. He was our Chief Medical Officer at the time. So at the summit, I was chairing a working group on smoking cessation, and we were discussing how we could try to get treatment free to smokers. And we were, you know, should we get one week's free, or should it be two weeks, or? You know, maybe four weeks, and he, he was wandering around the working groups, and he said, well, you know, what, what would you like? And we said, well, we'd obviously want much longer treatment free for smokers, and he said, well, ask for it. And although we didn't get it immediately, a few years after smoking kills, the penny was sort of dropping, and we did get these medications on prescription, which in England means basically free to smokers. Okay, so just to sum up so far, um, Working closely with stakeholders, including the users, is very important. The consensus bit it comes from the smoking cessation guidelines because we got widespread endorsement for them, and that's what enabled them to get into our government strategy. Um, making decisions about priorities and the need to look at adults as well as kids. I'm not saying we ignore kids. It's very important to keep a focus on kids, but don't let's forget adult smokers or tobacco users. But another group that's forgotten um, 
and Jonathan alluded to this, was um, those people with mental health problems. Unfortunately, my family is also blighted with um, mental illness. Um, and actually, mental illness and smoking often do uh, go together, as we now know. Um, and I know there's some interesting research on that. So I spend quite a lot of time uh, in mental health settings and uh, observing the fact that people were encouraged to smoke. Um, and it was like stepping back 30 or 40 years. Uh, and so um, we then started, started with a review, as always, commissioned by Judith Watt this time, um, and then a programme of research around how, how, trying to do something about smoking in mental health uh, settings, um, and working with some really great PhD students, Eleanor Ratchison, Gemma Taylor, who's here, um, and um, I'd also like to name uh, Debbie Robson, who's doing some great work uh, in this area as well. And if you fast forward 20 years or whatever, mental health and smoking is now part of our government strategy. So it's really, they're no longer forgotten and they're centre stage in our thinking. And I just want to mention if anybody's interested in this area, Action on Smoking and Health in England have set up a, a partnership, mental health and smoking partnership, and with lots of good resources uh, there. And I co-chair that partnership. Okay, so then I moved to harm reduction. Um, again, we had a, an international meeting. Um, we've already heard about John Slade, um, uh, who came along to that meeting and contributed. And it was a bit like going full circle and back to my roots around the role of nicotine in uh, smoking. And together with Marcus Manafo, building on some research we did, we tried to lay out what harm reduction really means and break it down. And um, it's strange because we all in this room, I think, collectively will accept that we think it's right to reduce harm to others. So we're all supportive of smoke-free places, for example. But when it comes to reducing harm to users, that's always a bit contentious. And I don't really understand why, which is what drew, drew me into uh, this area of research. Um, we broke it down into three areas, reducing the harmfulness of tobacco products, um, trying to draw smokers into the quitting process through reducing, uh, et cetera, and then the use of alternative nicotine uh, based products, which is what I'm focusing on. At the time, we ruled out doing anything to cigarettes to make them less harmful, and that was on the back of the low tar uh, debacle. Um, we also ruled out the nicotine reduction strategy for various reasons, and I've talked about this before, uh, so I won't talk about it again. Um, but I do recognize that uh, the US is in a, in a different place here um, than we are in the uh, UK. Happy to expand on that later. Um, but what we also were aware of through other research is that a lot of smokers are actually trying to do something about their smoking. They're actually trying to reduce the harmfulness of what they do. So surely it should be incumbent on, on us to help them to do that in a more evidence-informed way. So, I'm diverting a little bit again, but I want to uh, mention something else about uh, Richard Doll. This was in his obituary. Every time he saw some new data, he continued to revise his opinion, change his mind, and base his thoughts on the current evidence. Um, actually, interestingly, Richard Doll didn't spend a lot of time talking to the media or talking to policymakers about his research because he was very worried that if he did that, he then would find it difficult to change his position. Um, but, but he felt, so he believed that it was important as the facts change that you are able to change your mind. And in policy, um, it's quite well known path dependency as a theory so that when policymakers embark on a certain policy, it's very difficult to come back from that. Of course, in our field, we talk about confirmatory bias. So we're seeking out research which substantiates our own uh, beliefs about how things work. A couple of uh, quotes there from uh, a UK and US economist, which are pretty similar. OK, so um, when um, Britain decided to ban oral snuff, um, I thought it was a great idea and wrote um, a lot about it. Um, and you'll see a clever play on the John McCartney uh, Beatles uh, Band on the Run song, Bandits on the Run. Um, of course, there were many other uh, researchers who were saying much more sensible things at the uh, time. So I then thought, well, I better look more closely at the evidence. And I felt, feel that the evidence uh, was very strong, that um, in Sweden, uh, the use of snooze by men uh, has been going up when smoking has been going down. And that um, 
uh, reduction in smoking has been much quicker than among women who didn't use uh, snooze. But and, uh, snooze is a very highly regulated smokeless tobacco product. Um, but the epidemiology is uh, very strong, and the orange bars here are men. Um, Sweden is uh, at the lower end, so the percentage of deaths attributable to tobacco using the global burden of disease show that Sweden has the lowest burden. So despite their tobacco use being about the same as other populations, their nicotine use being about the same, um, they have a much lower burden of disease. So there's a very strong message in that, that you can have an alternative nicotine or tobacco product, um, and it can have a benefit to public health. So then if you look at things that are more, you might think are more specific to snoot use, use, so oral cancer, pancreatic cancer, this is just oral cancer, they're also at the lower end of the disease burden spectrum. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of sh other shout-outs. We've already heard from Tracy about the International Tobacco Control Policy Evaluation Project. Uh, this became my family a bit later on, uh, after I left Mike Russell's team. Um, and uh, Ron Borland, obviously, the John Slade winner, Jeff and Mike there, but actually a lot of work by a lot of people. Um, fantastic project. But I also want to give a shout-out to a more recent um, established consortium led by... Uh, Professor Kamran Siddiqui, one of the future leaders of the field. And this is around uh, smokeless tobacco in Southeast Asian countries um, called Astra. And um, I was invited to join this, which was uh, wonderful, because obviously paying a lot of attention to snooze, I didn't want to ignore the fact that smokeless tobacco use was um, causing a lot of death and disease in Southeast Asia, and indeed among Southeast Asian populations in the UK. So I was interested in what could be done to reduce that burden, but also perhaps whether there's something that could be done to the product, which would um, also make it less harmful. So just a few summary points there about not forgetting different populations, being able to change our mind, which of course I did on snooze, um, Think about why we might be less supportive of reducing harm to users. Um, but what I really want to move to is what conditions do the, does, do need, need to be in place for a nicotine or tobacco harm reducing product to have a benefit to public health. These products aren't going to go away. Um, we didn't invent them. Um, as you know, e-cigarettes came from a smoker trying to reduce the harmfulness of his smoking and his father's smoking. So these products aren't going to go back into the, the genie bottle. Um, they're out with us. So what can we do? What can we create around them to make sure they have a positive uh, effect? Okay, so um, Ken Warner, yes, the last uh, recipient, um, I uh, gave a wonderful talk about how to think, not feel, about tobacco harm reduction. And I hope I can build on that a little bit in the sort of second half of my talk. Um, just one thing, though, I disagree with uh, Ken, and I haven't managed to say this to him personally. I don't think he's here, but I'll, I'll try to ensure I do that. He talked about enthusiasts and skeptics. And I actually think that language isn't very helpful. We're all scientists, and we're all looking at the same data. And so when I'm working with people on papers and they divided us into opponents and proponents, I try to stop using that language um, because it sort of starts from a divisionary point of view. I think what we need to do is find what we agree on. So with the example of Sweden, do people agree with the data? If they don't, where do we disagree? And in fact, I meant to say, Jonathan, you did some wonderful work with Lars on uh, SNUS um, uh, as well, particularly showing there wasn't a gateway effect. So, you know, where do we agree and disagree? If we can't actually agree about the Swedish data, then I think we might struggle um, uh, taking this area forward. Okay, so I've talked about the need to make tobacco use a center to our research. Um, let's look at the product. What, what needs to happen to the product to make it have a positive public health impact? So essentially, we want to move people down the harm reduction continuum of nicotine products. Now, this isn't to scale. Essentially, combustible tobacco products are up here, and your non-combustibles are all bunched at the other end. Um, but, um, and that's been sort of likened to the dirty and the clean uh, syringe. Most of what I'm going to talk about is e-cigarettes, because SNUS is banned in England, um, and some of the other products are, are newer. Um, but I will also mention a bit on nicotine replacement therapy. So, the first thing I think um, we need to think about with the product is what are the relative risks in relation to smoking. So I'm not going to try and explain this graph. 
Those of you who are familiar with it, um, uh, great. If not, read Lynn Kozlowski's brilliant paper. But essentially, what it says is if, if you've got a product on the right-hand side where you've got a reduction in risk by 80, 90, or 100 percent, the line shows the number of times the proportion of users, um, you, you would have to multiply the proportion of users to get an equal effect. So let me give you an example. In England, we've got 15% of smokers. So if we've got a product that's 90% less harmful, we'd have to multiply that 15% by 10, which would give us 150%, which is impossible. So essentially, if all the smokers stopped and the whole population took up this product, we would have a net public health benefit. I hope you're with me, <laughs> if not read Lynn's paper. Um, but essentially what that's underscoring is the, m the enormity of the public health problems caused by cigarette smoking. It is so deadly. Okay? So, um, commentators like David Levy, or rather excellent researchers like David Levy and Cora Gartner, have done work to estimate the risk of smokeless tobacco uh, snus. Um, David Levy did a, um, a Delphi... Uh, Coral did a, uh, a modeling study. But interestingly, they both came up to the figure of around 90 to 95% less harmful. So this is snus, remember, a highly regulated, low nitrosamine smokeless tobacco product. Interestingly, David Levy didn't get quite the opprobrium that we got um, when in, um, when was it? 2015, um, we did our, a report of e-cigarettes and made the pronouncement of them being around 95% less harmful. So I thought, I'd spend a couple of minutes on that um, and just try and explain its uh, provenance. So um, one thing I would say, actually, is that we probably um, didn't present it as well as we could have done. So uh, reaching out there, um, we probably, in a 250-page report, we probably could have explained it better. So actually, we then went on to provide a little bit of a postscript after the event where we basically explain that if you look at the constituents in cigarette smoke and you look at the constituents in uh, e-cigarette vapor, then they're, they're, the constituents of cigarette smoke are either not there or they're at, at levels of 5% or lower. And then when you look at the constituents of e-cigarettes that aren't in cigarettes, there wasn't any um, evidence of any serious harmful effects. Okay? We did draw on the nut paper, but... It wasn't just the nut paper that we relied on. Uh, there was also a review by Peter Hayek with Jean-Francois Etter, Neil Benevitz, Tom Eisenberg, and Hayden McRobbie that was uh, around at the time, and also the work that Robert West, myself, and others did on drawing together the literature. And why, oh, sorry, yes, it got attacked. I think you probably all know that. Um, we got roundly attacked on all sides. Um, and one of the, the accusations was that we were saying they were harmless. Well, do the maths. In England, 78,000 people die every year as a result of cigarette smoking. So if a product is 95% less harmful, that's still 4,000 deaths. We never said they were safe. Um, so that is not what we said. Um, we were also attacked on the other side by people who said, well, where's the evidence for the 5% um, of the risk? So we really didn't... Um, uh, land that well at all. Anyway, um, but why did, we, why did we actually say it? Why did we go there? I often wonder that. Um, because it was the best estimate at the time. When we were looking at the data that we had at the time, it seemed an appropriate estimate to do. And it's since been corroborated by other reviews, such as the Royal College of Physicians, um, who made a more eloquent statement um, that it was unlikely to exceed 5% of the harm from smoking tobacco. Again, another call out to Sir Richard Doll. Um, in an interview where he basically had set out to look at the, um, whether smoking had any effect on lung cancer, as Jonathan was saying, um, and then found all these other diseases. But he said, well, actually, when we realized there were 4,000 different chemicals in cigarette smoke, then it wasn't really surprising that there was a whole range of other diseases that we found. Uh, I think that's now 7,000. I think we talk about 7,000 smoke constituents. But again, just to underscore how deadly cigarette smoking is. So um, in our next report in 2018, um, we reviewed, uh, again, studies, and we corroborated it uh, and reported again that they were 95% or less. And during that interval, there have been some studies on biomarkers, which are often the, um, a good measure to use when you haven't got the long-term harmfulness. Um, this graph is showing some of the biomarker data. The striped bars are uh, non-smokers, and the full bars are e-cigarette users. And you can see that for some of them, they're comparable. 
Um, now, there's big caveats around this, and if you're interested in it, read the 2018 report, uh, because there are lots of different studies, but they were the best available at the time. Um, and actually, I don't think we were a million miles away from what the US uh, NASM report uh, said, uh, which came out around the same time, where it talked about e-cigarettes being likely to be far less harmful than combustible tobacco cigarettes. So a lot was made of the difference, but I actually think um, that uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, blue water between us. Please go on, whatever the expression is. Anyway, uh, the other reason we said it was because we were worried about the fact that misperceptions of e-cigarettes were very high. So the top line there, the blue line, is less harmful than regu regular cigarettes, which I think we'd probably all agree in this room is the right answer. E-cigarettes are less harmful. You might disagree on the extent, but they're less harmful. That was going in the wrong direction, and the green line is equally harmful, um, and as you can see, that's been going up. So actually, our 2015 report didn't really help with correcting the misperceptions, um, sadly. And then just in case you're interested in the prevalence of smoking and vaping in adults, this is from our latest report, which was published last week. The dotted lines are from various studies and show that smoking prevalence in England has been continuing to decline. Um, the e-cigarette use is the bottom lines, um, and that's also plateaued really since 2015. Okay, so I've talked about relative risks and how you need to get a substantially lower risk product uh, compared with smoking. But I want to talk about acceptability because it's no good having a product that has a much reduced risk if nobody wants to use it. So um, I wanted to just mention that we actually did quite a lot of work with nicotine replacement therapy um, over the years um, to try to broaden its um, reach. I talked about getting it on prescription. We broadened the licensing. Um, but actually, the research that we then subsequently did showed that it didn't have an enormous effect. Now, this is partly because people weren't prescribing it, so we could blame the health professionals, but I think we could also blame a bit the consumers who weren't really, um, there wasn't really a demand for nicotine replacement therapy. So acceptability of the product is important. Um, the Royal College of Physicians has been um, following this um, in various reports, which I've also been involved with. But the um, middle quote there was saying that, um, is really summarizing what this is getting at, which is if we can uh, find nicotine, if it can be produced in a way that is acceptable and effective as a cigarette substitute, millions of lives could be saved. And I think with e-cigarettes, we're getting there. Um, in terms of nicotine delivery, uh, work by uh, a number of different people, Lynn Dawkins, um, uh, Constantinos Vasilinas, uh, Peter Hayek and others, have shown that uh, the latest models of e-cigarettes approach uh, cigarette smoking in terms of their nicotine delivery. The next slide is a bit heretical, so apologies for that, but when you talk to smokers, um, actually it's not this one, this one does show that it's e-cigarettes are a, a, a popular support used in crit attempts, so that's a kind of indication of acceptability. Uh, it's the next slide, I think. Yeah. So um, when you talk to smokers, they often talk about their enjoyment from smoking. Now, yes, a lot of that is due to withdrawal relief um, that they feel because they're um, in withdrawal when they smoke a cigarette. But actually, they do talk about enjo enjoyment. And I think that's something we have to try and engage with a bit when we're thinking about alternative products. So about 50% of smokers will say that, quite consistent across different countries. These are ITC data. And we've only got two years of data from vaping, but you're getting pretty similar percentages. So as a product, a substantially lower risk, it seems to be delivering nicotine, and it seems to be acceptable to smokers. The sort of, the sort of slightly weird thing, though, is um, as well as enjoyment, people often regret uh, that they took up smoking. Um, I don't think we've got questions on regret about vaping yet, so we need to start adding those to our studies. Okay, so a significantly less harmful product delivering nicotine similar to cigarettes and being acceptable to smokers. So the third sort of part I think we need if we're going to ensure that these products have a benefit, a beneficial effect on public health is the environment. And I'm not going to go into this because it's quite dry. It's talking about the regulatory framework. But the key point is that these products need to be regulated. So snus is a regulated product in terms of its nitrosamine levels. Um, but I do want to point out that in the UK, we have a quite a strong regulatory framework for e-cigarettes. Um, and we have product standards. 
Um, we have controls on nicotine limits um, and various other things which are in this slide, which I won't go through. But the key point, actually, I think that we have, and this is based on European regulations. I think we've gone a, a step further in the UK. So it's, it's kind of wrong to say that the UK is a very liberal environment for e-cigarettes. We're not. We have quite a strong regulatory framework around them. And actually, we've got a public-facing database so an e-cigarette user can go on that database and check if their product is one that's been notified to our medicines agency. So they can check if they're using one of these products. Um, we have yellow card system, which is basically where vapors can, or health professionals can um, notify the medicines agency of any adverse effects. So there's a lot of data on that in our latest Public Health England report, so I encourage you to read it if you've got any interest in this. But it is very different from the US, I believe, um, and what appears to be happening, and I'm looking forward to being corrected later, is that um, in response to some of the uh, rather dreadful marketing of e-cigarettes. Um, what seems to happen here in the States at any rate is that then there's a campaign then about um, how not to vape. I, I do struggle with this one a little bit because I've seen no evidence of worms in the cheeks as um, a consequence of uh, e-cigarette use, so um, I don't quite follow that one. The approach we're taking in the UK, and I have to say I'm sounding like I think the UK is wonderful, but it, there's a lot of problems with it. But on this, I think we've done some things right, and one is to actually heavily restrict the marketing of e-cigarettes. But also the approaches by the uh, public health bodies, I think, are very different. So in England, uh, Public Health England have tried to do the mark uh, any uh, mass media campaigns around stopping smoking. They've tried to... Uh, position these products as being attractive to middle-aged, rather unattractive, sorry, men in the audience, um, smokers. Whereas I th when I've looked on the websites uh, in the US, there's, there's a lot more around the youth um, culture around vaping. And I know where my kids would um, you know, be orienting themselves into uh, this group here on the right. Um, who are obviously having fun with their e-cigarettes. So I think we've just got to be a little bit careful about how we portray uh, these products. The other context is that um, often said that, you know, we're neglecting the other components of tobacco control. We're not. Harm reduction is, very, is a complementary uh, approach to cessation and prevention. In Europe, we have a tobacco control scale, which basically um, measures how well countries are doing on comprehensive tobacco control strategies. And again, uh, I'm getting a bit apologetic about the UK now, but we're at the top of the leaderboard in relation to our comprehensive tobacco control strategy. Interestingly, Sweden, you remember the data I was showing a bit earlier on, is quite a bit lower down. So it means that even if you haven't got a comprehensive tobacco control strategy in place, it is possible for these products to have a positive public health impact. Although I would say that uh, uh, in Sweden, I think advertising of any tobacco product is banned, so that probably does need to be in place. Um, I thought you might all need waking up at this point. Um, so anybody know what this is? Yeah, it's a urinal. Any, any other? Nudge, yay, thank you. Um, so um, I spent an evening at a conference chatting to a gentleman from Amsterdam by the side of me, and I was going on about nudge, and said, you know, I'd really love to have this picture. So this is a picture of a painted fly in a urinal, urinal even, in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. And the idea of it, apparently, is so that men target their urine um, more closely so they don't spill out all over the place. So I said to this chap I was sitting by, I'd love to have a photo. So when he went back to Amsterdam, he took a photograph for me and sent it to me. So it's great, I use it in all my teaching now. Um, so um, the point of that is that it comes from this book called Nudge. I think it was called Nudge, a couple of economists who wrote it. Um, and it's about how we need to nudge people in the right direction. And I'm a great fan of nudge because I know I'm influenced when I go in supermarkets. You know, I take off what's at eye level, buy one, get one free, all that kind of rubbish. Um, so I think if we can make the less harmful product the easy choice, then we'll drive smokers to taking some of these um, uh, other products. So my ideal environment would be one in which you go in 
and you've got your cigarettes behind closed doors, plain packaging, all the rest of it, um, but they've got the array of nicotine replacement therapy, e-cigarettes, blah, 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 and people can talk to them about, you know, these are much less harmful products. And, and what I really wanted to make a point of here around some of this other work we've done on tobacco control is that we need to co-regulate these products with tobacco. So really get the tobacco products much high, more highly priced than these alternatives so we can drive smokers to them. So that's the learning uh, around here. We need a regulatory framework around the products. Tobacco harm reduction is complementary. However, you can still have regulated products added to a market where perhaps the tobacco control strategy uh, isn't uh, comprehensive. Uh, and Japan was talked about a bit this morning, but the evidence from Japan is that um, the smoking rates are falling there as these products are uh, being taken up. Okay, so the final uh, circle then in this is the tobacco control community. So we've got the users, we've got the product, we've got the environment, uh, but we've also got us. And I talked about our consortium, we're evolving, we're now called Spectrum. Um, SR&T, this is from the bag, so saving lives begins with science. Um, so I think, yes, as scientists, we need to try to come together um, and, ag and agree. But also, I want to give, um, in the UK anyway, a big call out to our advocates. I've had the privilege of working with two very strong um, directors of action on smoking and health over the years. Uh, the previous one was Clive Bates, who's now a freelance consultant. The current one is Deborah Arnott, who is here. Um, and they're very different people with very different approaches. <laughs> I can hear Deborah laughing. Um, but they are both informed by the evidence, and that's so important if you've got advocates who are interested in the evidence. And I do want to mention uh, Deborah's work towards a smoke-free 2030. So she's announced this campaign that in 10 years' time, in England, we're going to go smoke-free. So um, uh, an ambitious strategy um, to reach. But we also need strong governance, so civil servants and um, uh, people in government who are also informed by the science. So this is Martin Dockerell, who's also here from Public Health England, and I know that some of his colleagues are also here, and again, very science-driven. And by, by doing that, when we're all looking at the science, we can then get a consensus, and indeed we did get a consensus on e-cigarettes um, uh, from our non-governmental organizations, our professional bodies, um, as well as um, uh, others. So uh, Public Health England, as I said, very science-driven, and they've asked us to review the evidence on e-cigarettes over the years, and I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues who've, um, who do the hard graft on these uh, uh, reports, um, rather than talk about them, which I do a lot of. Um, so Sarah Hitchman, uh, Leonie Bros, uh, Debbie Robson, Linda, I've already talked about, who's in Edinburgh, and Rob Calder. Uh, those four are from uh, King's, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, their work on these reports. So very quickly, I'm just going to say, what's the impact of all of this in the UK? Well, I think there's um, irrefutable evidence uh, that in England, uh, e-cigarettes are helping smokers to quit. I haven't got time to go through all the evidence. There's some papers there that you can look at. Um, estimate of about 50 to 70,000 smokers. Uh, each year, um, additional quitters, rather, each year because of electronic cigarettes. Um, and just a paper, um, a cross-section analysis here in the corner, but it's quite interesting, I think, that vapors um, seem to be smokers who are more dependent uh, before they quit um, than the non-vapors uh, in this particular ITC study, um, but we're more confident about quitting. Now, obviously, we need to see that longitudinally. On initiating smoking, again, uh, we're seeing the lowest rates of smoking among our 11 to 15 year olds. Um, we're seeing um, not, uh, we're seeing a sort of plateauing of e-cigarette use there, regular e-cigarette use, 2014, 2016, 2018 is the gray bar. Um, this is 11 to 15 year olds, so we're not seeing any big rises in e-cigarette use. Uh, and most of the e-cigarette use is concentrated amongst people who already had some experience of smoking. So we're not seeing never smokers um, taking up e-cigarettes. So also, if you look at the slightly older group, 16 to 24 year olds, again, smoking rates coming down. So I think we've got the balance about right with uh, the regulatory structure. Perhaps it's a little bit in, in favor of um, kids and minimizing the uptake of kids. 
because for adults, you've seen use was plateauing, and actually about 40% of smokers in England have never tried an e-cigarette. And given that's a much less harmful product, that's not good. So perhaps we need to rebalance uh, a little bit. Um, and there's some ideas there about uh, how we might do that. Um, we probably also want to look at packaging, some of the bright packaging for e-cigarettes. But I just wanted to put up one slide, because I know it's um, the flavor of the month, talking about banning flavors of e-cigarettes. Uh, Action on Smoking and Health um, run an annual survey on e-cigarettes, again, because they want to be informed by the evidence. And they asked the question of uh, vapors who were vaping flavors, what would you do if flavors were banned? And as you can see from this graph, um, the worrying thing is that the two bars on the left-hand side are, I would still try to get flavors, or I would, um, use, yeah, I would use unflavored as one, and then I'd go back to smoking tobacco. So there is a bit of concern there about what happens when you take, off, take out the flavors from uh, e-cigarettes, partly because it makes the e-cigarettes pretty unpalatable. But we don't want to be driving users to the illicit market. I think that's the point I probably want to make. OK, um, we know that we're different um, so far. We continue to monitor. It might change. But um, Dave Hammond is here. He's got more data from the ITC youth study, which is showing different patterns in Canada and the US. So look out for his uh, research, which I think is tomorrow afternoon. Um, but we've got a really interesting natural experiment going on here across countries with different regulatory uh, patterns. Um, and uh, so it's a ripe area for research and research like the ITC project, which can compare countries. OK, I'm getting near the end. You'll be very pleased to hear. Um, but I was looking for an analogy in other fields. And it's quite hard to find an analogy between what's going on in smoking and vaping. Um, so I looked at the illicit drugs field. And um, opioid users who've been moved on to methadone as a way of reducing the harmfulness of their opioid use. And there's a big debate in the illicit drugs field about um, whether uh, people should be kept on methadone or whether they should then be helped to come off methadone um, to recover, if you like, completely from their drug use. I hope I've explained that well enough. But alongside this report, there was a, a lovely editorial, I thought, which is called Come Together, which is um, another Beatles song for those of you who are from Liverpool. Um, but it was good because they had this quote in the editorial, which I just suggest you perhaps read. The results have been polarization within the treatment and policy fields, stigmatization of individuals who need care and confusion among the public. The emotional charge and the moralistic nature of these battles have also constrained the nature of the scientific evaluation prevented rational discussion, and ultimately retarded progress in our field. Does that sound familiar? What they said as a solution to this is that you need to look at the opioid users or the methadone users, because some of them do want to come off methadone, and that will be their recovery. But other previous opioid users are very happy methadone users and quite content to be on methadone for the rest of their lives. So it sort of brings me full circle to saying, Again, we need to remember all of our smokers are different, but we need to start putting them more centrally in our research in relation to whether we need to be worried about people who are just switching to vaping and carrying on vaping, um, or whether we should be encouraging them to stop, and it would probably be very different for different users. Very excitingly, um, we've just won the commission for the 2022 review of e-cigarettes, which is focusing on e-cigarette safety. And in an attempt to try to bridge some of these um, fractious debates, uh, we've reached out to some international uh, experts in the field to help us to write this report. And we've uh, drawn in a couple of the US uh, 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 authors of the NASM report to help us with this. So hopefully this is the sort of first step, certainly from our side, in trying to build a consensus. I know there's a lot of other efforts going on. Um, but I'm very excited by this, but I'm also incredibly daunted and wondering what we've um, taken on. OK, so to conclude, I think it's important that we put smokers, tobacco users at the center of our research efforts. I believe they have a right to use less harmful products, hopefully ones with a significant reduction in risk. I do believe that we need to focus on adult smoking, um, but we also need to con you know, try to minimize risks to children. 
I think we need a product which is significantly less harmful than cigarettes, which is acceptable to the users. We need to regulate it appropriately. We need to co-regulate it with smoking. And we need to monitor and tweak the regulations quickly as appropriate when things start going in the wrong direction, or if things go in the wrong direction. We need to be willing to change our mind as research evolves. Um, and I think I'd like to say it would be nice to try to find common ground and consensus rather than differences. And for the younger people in the audience, I think I've painted a little bit of a negative image. One of the things I'd like to say is that over the last 35 years or however long it's been, I've never ever been bored by this topic. You know, one day you're thinking about toxicology, once, another day on pharmacology, another on psychology. Um, it's a fascinating area. Um, and I think it's, it'd be really, it's a really good field to stay in. Um, but um, I think uh, younger researchers can play a key role in driving these debates, perhaps in a more, uh, in a direction of a greater consensus. Uh, so that's it. I'd like to thank the Nicotine Research Group at King's College. That's not all of them. I can only find these photographs. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank Dr. Debbie Robson, who's um, given, given me an enormous uh, amount of help with putting this presentation together. And apologies to anybody whose slides I've inadvertently used, which I know I can do. Um, but I'd again like to say thank you very much indeed uh, uh, for listening and for the uh, honour and privilege of this award. Thank you. Are you open for questions, I guess? Yes, yes. yes. Who's speaking? I can't see. It's Jazz, Brian. Jazz Alawalia back here. Oh, hi, Jazz. Sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> and that was uh, absolutely fantastic, the presentation. And uh, I know you were worried that people here would throw eggs at you, and I promised you that would protect you. You notice there are no eggs being thrown at you. <laughs> Not uh, yet. <laughs> yes. Still a few days That's left true. of the conference. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, well, that was really great, uh, brilliant, charming, uh, and funny, um, and with very good science. So my question is the following. Um, so I believe, and you believe, and I guess others here do as well, it's in the SRT logo and motto that science should inform policy. Uh, I would say in general in the US that's not happening, and I would say in the UK it appears to be happening. But if science should inform policy, um, I know this is not the topic of your talk, but to, to go one step further now, what would you say the science that needs to happen now um, empir the empirical science that needs to occur uh, moving forward, whether it's here in the UK or whatever, to, to make these better decisions on whether it's safety or efficacy or reduction. I hope my question makes sense. It's a very broad question, so you're welcome to answer it however you, you want. Uh, by the way, Jazz Alawai from Brown University. Thank, thank you, Jazz, and particularly for your uh, very kind comments. I mean, I think it is a, a challenge because this is a rapidly evolving market. Um, the products are evolving. They're improving, I think, largely over uh, time, but it's often that randomized controls trials are quickly out of date if they use some of the obsolete products, although I did um, have Peter Hayek's trial at there, which was uh, a, a really impressive and very thorough piece of research. But interestingly, people who'd called for randomized control trials then weren't happy with it. So I think we need to triangulate our research. We do need more, more trials, but we also need observational data. Um, we need more of the same. We need more uh, research uh, in this area. So I'll call out to any funders who are uh, here because it's particularly important. Projects like the ITC um, are really useful because they can look, look at the natural experiment of countries where there are different regulations uh, and see the impact because we don't yet know. I mean, I've tried to speculate what the conditions are to, for these products to have a positive impact, but we don't know that. Um, so we need much more research. And, and it's surprising, really, so little research in Sweden given uh, the data which is, which is showing a very positive effect. So I hope that goes some way to answering your questions. But there's a whole load of people in here who can probably also uh, contribute over um, uh, the networking sessions later. Okay. Hi, uh, Joanna Cohn from Johns Hopkins. Thank you very much, Anne, for giving such a great overview of 
where the UK is now, how you got there, and, and sort of your view on the important factors to be considering. So I have a very specific question, um, and it was on one of your slides that you didn't want to talk about too much because you had a lot to say on the regulatory framework, and you had a, a bullet point about nicotine dose. And I was wondering just from your perspective and what you've seen and how you're interpreting the evidence and thinking about your four circles of the users and the environment, et cetera, what are, you, what are your thoughts on what the ideal dose of nicotine should be from e-cigarettes, like particularly in relation to, to the dose from cigarettes? I mean, that's a great question, and um, I'm not sure I can answer it. Um, we've got a lovely natural experiment again going on in North America where you've got much higher levels of nicotine, 50-odd, uh, and in the UK and Europe where it's constrained at 20. Um, so we'll be able to try to understand um, the impact of that. So perhaps some of the concerns in Canada and the US around youth uptake, perhaps they're related to the higher nicotine levels, um, but I don't know. Um, I mean, I've talked about nicotine delivery being really important in relation to acceptability to smokers, and we haven't had a 2050 head-to-head uh, -head trial, so that would be brilliant research, going back to what Giles, Giles was saying, to see whether the 50 does help smokers more, so a greater proportion of smokers stopped. But quite where the sweet spot is, I don't know. From the ASH surveys, most um, uh, vapors are using, um, I think it's around 16 uh, milligram, um, from, but um, I, don't, I don't think we know the answer yet to that, but I think it's a really important important question, because I don't know, um, some argue that the 20 limit uh, in, in Europe is uh, too low. Thank you. But thank you. Um, thank you, Anne. I would like to echo what Joanna said. That was a great talk. Um, my question is uh, more philosophical, I would think. So um, in the US, we have very strong empirical scientific evidence from national surveys that kids are using e-cigarettes. Um, you obviously do not have that problem in the UK, which is wonderful. So I have asked many people these questions. What is it that you guys did right? Uh, you know, you talked about that balance where you talked about how you had policies in place so kids did not use. What are some of those? I'm not sure I quite understand what they are. Perhaps you could talk a little bit more about that? Yes, of course, thank you. Um, actually, one thing I meant to say when I showed the regulatory slides um, was that there'll be an SRNT uh, university webinar coming up about the different regulations around e-cigarettes around the world. I think that'll be down the line in about a month or so, so that's something to look out for. Um, where they're comparing lots of different countries and their regulatory structures and potential impact. Um, well, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, Martin Jarvis did some analysis of the NYTS data, which suggested that a lot of the e-cigarette use in the US um, was um, among uh, regular smokers as well. So the regular use of e-cigarettes seemed to be predominantly in the US, mirroring the UK situation and being used predominantly by people who'd already got experience of smoking. And I think there's a couple of other research studies underway on that. But if we are observing an increase in vaping in, in young people and drawing never smokers into it, if there is evidence of that. I mean, I would, I would think that our marketing restrictions are particularly important in the UK. Um, obviously, um, we don't want to um, not have any marketing of the product, so our marketing of e-cigarettes is restricted to a retail point of sale, um, so they're not allowed to market um, uh, in broadcast media, for example. They're, the localized marketing is also allowed on billboards and things. Uh, but we also have an advertising code, so the um, vapors can't be uh, seen to be attractive to young people, for example. Um, they can't look like cigarette smoking. So there's a lot of controls around the marketing which are probably important. There are probably a lot of other reasons, and um, there are some UK folk in the, in the audience who could probably uh, add to this answer, but I think that would probably be a good place to start. So, sorry, just to follow up. So, you do have vape shops, though, in England, correct? Yes. And you do have social media in England. So, kids are seeing the same social media that kids in the US do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is why I'm very confused about why 
the kids are kids. You know, adolescents in the UK are not different from adolescents in the US in oh. terms of developmental parameters, impulsivity, risk taking, and yet there are these differences. And uh, this is why I can't quite put my finger on it. So I think one thing w w which we really need to get our heads around are the extent to which there are big differences, as I said, whether they are smokers who are switching or, or um, and naive nicotine uh, users who are who are taking their, them up. But I also think the portrayal, and you know, I did show a couple of public health images where I, I think in the US there were some photographs around young people using them and make, looking rather cool and almost advertising that these look like a flash drive so you can hide them. Um, and I showed the marketing from the UK, which is, is very much aimed at a more uh, older. So there, 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 there are, I think, quite a lot of differences in terms of the positioning of the products uh, between the uh, US and UK. But I think it's an interesting question which merits further research. But Thank as you. a researcher, one would say that one. Hi, uh, Benjamin Toll from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, congratulations on your award, and of course, congrats to Tracy as well. Um, it was a great talk. At one point in around the middle, you said that you feel that NASM and Public Health England had a similar language. And, and while the language might be similar, I think we could probably agree that the tone and the demeanor of the NASM report is much more negative. And so it's really a two-part question. Part one is, why do you think it's so much more negative? And number two is, what do you think could be done to increase the positivity on the US side? Um, again, a very interesting question. I don't think I've got all the answers um, to that. Um, I think we focus very much on human studies, and I think perhaps there were more uh, uh, animal studies, and of course the general, generalizability of animal studies to humans uh, isn't always terribly clear, so our focus is predominant on human studies. Um, what are the differences between the uh, reports and what can be done? I think your second part of your question is what could be done to make it more positive. Well, hopefully, through the work we'll be doing around the 2022 report, where we'll be working alongside uh, experts from the NASM report, um, we'll be able to perhaps see more clearly the areas of agreement versus the areas of, of disagreement. I think also, you know, this balance between youth and um, uh, adults is different. Um, I mean, we care about both, um, which I hope I came across in my talk. Um, but the, the US focus seems to be largely focused on kids. And for the, all the reasons I tried to explain, I think um, there's a danger in doing that because, uh, and particularly for countries where e-cigarettes are prohibited, you really are just driving your smokers to continue smoking. And so, you know, getting the balance in the regulation, regulations is tremendously difficult. Um, but I think by keeping an, an eye on the target of adult smokers, would probably, I think, um, mean that the report would report the evidence more positively. But I mean, those people who are involved in NASM, it'd be great to get your views um, if there's anyone here during the networking breaks. But thank you for your Thanks question. Thanks so much. There was no mention, um, Linda Ferry from Loma Linda University, California. There was no mention about E Valley. Um, in your report, and I'm wondering, we have 68 deaths reported in the U.S. Is this because of a specific brand marketed here that they're thinking, as opposed to what you have and the regulations you have there? Uh, Evali, I think, is now it's pretty clear that Evali is due to the use of uh, vaping illicit THC cut with uh, vitamin E acetate. It's nothing to do with the nicotine regulated products that are. Uh, on the market here, and probably the nicotine electronic cigarettes that are on the market in the US. So I think we need to make a very clear distinction, and I think it took quite a long time for that to become clear in the public pronouncements about Ivali. Um, so I, I, I would say that that's a very different subject to the subject that I'm talking about here. It's possible that in the US, because of the uh, legalization of marijuana, um, there's potentially some uh, uh, more people vaping marijuana, but I, I, to be honest, I think we need to separate these things uh, completely because it's not about the kind of products that I've been talking about today. It's not related to those. Does that help? 
Yes, uh, some of the reports um, from the CDC say that some of the cases, confirmed cases, claimed no exposure to marijuana. Yeah. So that could have been an 18-year-old who didn't want mom to know. Precisely. Right? Yeah. But we don't know that, and it looks like some are still have occurred in people who are not just teenagers who say, I have never used marijuana. Yeah, I mean, and it's possible that some people will have uh, a reaction to the products in uh, uh, nicotine vaping products. Um, we have had a handful of deaths in the UK since 2011. We've had five deaths since 2011, but the causality of those um, has not been established. But during that time, we've had 700,000 deaths caused by cigarette smoking. So going back to my relative risks, um, you know, that's a 0 .000 something 1% of the risk. So I think, again, we need to keep it in pro proportion. Obviously, any death from these products is a, a tragedy. Um, but I think we need to be very clear about what they are vaping. And my understanding of it is that it's uh, uh, most frequently these illicit products uh, that have been used. Okay, hi. Uh, uh, Mohamed Ismail from uh, Southern California, Kaiser Permanente. My understanding is that in the U.S. in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen about a 35% reduction in combustible cigarette use. Sorry, it's hard to see. Yes, I've oh, got you now. Thank you. Yeah, we have, if we have about a 35% reduction in our combustible tobacco use in the U.S., you know, without taking a policy similar to that in the U.K., and even where I work locally, we've seen about a 35% reduction in the last uh, five years. Um, then th doesn't it make sense that we'll be more concerned about the tremendously increasing use am uh, among youth since it seems that combustible tobacco is, is almost declining on its own with, without e-cig use? Yeah, and I'm not saying, I don't want anybody to go away from this uh, thinking that I'm encouraging young people to uh, be using these products. I'm not. Um, if, an, if a young person is smoking a cigarette, then yes, one would be encouraging them to stop smoking using all of the tools at, at their uh, availability, including uh, e-cigarettes. So I do think that you know, with a proper regulatory structure, and I'm afraid here in the US, I don't think um, there is a regulatory framework around. There's about to be um, with your PMTAs coming down the line in May. So there's about to be a regulatory structure around them. And it'd be interesting to see if that makes any difference. Um, but I talked about perhaps some of the reasons why um, young people in the U.S. should be, um, could be, uh, using these products because of the, uh, you know, the advertising, et cetera, et cetera, and perhaps some of the public health campaigning as well. So I'm not saying that this isn't a, a, a concern, but I think let's get it in proportion as well because, um, I mean, I'm glad I'm not a kid today, frankly, because there's a lot of pressures on kids, there's a lot of mental pro mental health problems, um, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of marijuana use, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we need to get our messages in proportion and in relation to the other things that are going on in kids' lives. And I think we've got to be very careful by, you know, going back to what Richard Dole said, um, you know, if we say don't use these products, if someone my age is telling a kid not to use them, I'm going to be driving them towards them. So I think we need, just need to be very careful about what we say about these products so we don't make them uh, attractive to young people. Hi, Anne, it's, it's Deborah. Um, just to add, You're chairing. sorry, Go sorry, um, not not to um, uh, ask a question, I'm afraid, but to add to the point you were making earlier. Thank that, you, thank you. That actually, um, we don't we, we look at regular use um, and don't define regular use as last 30 days, which I think is an odd way of looking at regular use. Um, I think we know that the proportion of young people who try smoking and then go on to become regular daily smokers is something like two-thirds from Peter Hayek's systematic review. And certainly, our data don't show anything like that for e-cigarettes. So I think, you know, in terms of what are the risks, you need to put it in that broader context. But last but not least, you know, you showed those public health ads, which I think if they were put out by um, an e-cigarette company, would be banned immediately, showing 
jewel as something you can hide, looking like a flash drive, yeah. um, uh, brightly coloured e-cigarettes, and a whole riot, row of really cool-looking young teenagers vaping. We don't have anything like that, and our surveys show, and we asked this question specifically after Matt Myers was quoted in one of our leading national newspapers saying, Jules coming your way, vaping's gonna suddenly become terribly cool. So we asked young, um, you know, 11 to 18 year olds, why are you vaping? And almost none of them said because they thought it looked cool. They said, because we wanted to give it a try. Yeah, thank you, Deborah, for adding to the answer, because I'm- Can I, can I just say here. something here? Gideon's what? Alan, Can we make this the last question? We're yeah, kind of Gideon and Allen, UCSF, and I didn't want anybody living here with a negative impression of what the NISM, the NISM report, since someone said there was a, it was more negative compared to Public Health England. And I just want to read one of the excerpts from the report. It says, which is very similar, except we did not, in full disclosure, I was one of the committee members, we did not put a number on the risk. Yeah. It says, across a range of studies and outcomes, e-cigarettes appear to pose less risk to an individual than combustible tobacco cigarettes. So we didn't say it's 95% safer. We did say that it poses less risk compared to combustible cigarettes. So I didn't want anybody Thank living there thinking that, oh, the Nissan report was negative to e-cigarettes. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to everybody for their participation and thanks very much to Anne McNeil. Thank you, Jonathan.